Oh, you don't mind this is recording, right? That's fine. Okay. Great, okay. Well, let's get started. Um, so we're really delighted uh, to have Al Hayek uh, talk to us today. Al is a professor at ANU, and today he's going to be talking about consequentialism, cluelessness, clumsiness, and counterfactuals. Thanks, Kyle. I'm equally delighted to be here. Thanks for coming, and it's just so good to be here. I spent much of my philosophical life thinking about probability and counterfactuals, and now I find myself turning more and more to moral philosophy. And I'm realizing more and more just how central to it are foundational issues in probability and counterfactuals. So today I want to present some of those issues. There's a handout, and it's mainly just quotes and some definitions, but mainly you'll have to listen to me. We're up to just the first bit. According to a standard statement of objective consequentialism, a morally right action is one that has the best consequences. More generally, given a choice between two actions, one is morally better than the other, just in case the consequences of the former action are better than those of the latter. Hi, Shane. These are not just the immediate consequences of the actions, but the long-term consequences, perhaps until the end of history. Now, this account glides off the tongue easily, so easily, that one may not notice that on one understanding it literally makes no sense, and on another understanding it has a startling metaphysical presupposition concerning counterfactuals. And I'll bring this presupposition into relief. Objective consequentialism has faced various objections, including so-called cluelessness. We have no idea what most of the consequences of our actions will be. And I think objective consequentialism has a far worse problem. Its very foundations are highly dubious. And even granting those foundations a worse problem than cluelessness remains what I'll call clumsiness. And I think that these problems quickly generalize to a number of other moral theories. Basically, I want to take down all the moral theory today. <laughs> but the point's most easily made for objective consequentialism, so I'll focus largely on it. And I'll consider three ways that it might be improved. The first, appeal instead to short-term consequences of actions. Second, understand consequences with objective probabilities. Third, understand consequences with subjective or evidential probabilities. And subjective probabilities may be rationally constrained or not constrained by evidential probabilities. I'll canvas a leading candidate for such a constraint, the principle of indifference. I'll argue that it has serious problems besides the well-known ones. But if probabilities are not constrained, then subjective consequentialism does not deserve its title as a theory of moral action. And I'll briefly consider a way in which they may be constrained by objective probabilities, but even there, they're the dragons. And if you're following along, we're up to actual or counterfactual consequences. Julian Savalesco and Dominique Wilkinson write, according to consequentialism, the right act is the, that act which has the best consequences. And similarly, Julia Driver writes, Consequentialism is the view that the moral quality of an action, for example, the rightness of the action, is completely determined by the action's consequences relative to the consequences of alternative actions open to the agent. Hilary Graves characterizes objective consequentialism thus, the moral status of an action is determined entirely by how it compares to alternative actions in terms of the goodness of its consequences. And she says more generally, A1, is objectively C better than A2, if and only if the consequences of A1 are better than those of A2. C better is her term of art for the comparison that will matter to the consequentialists. Now, notice that this implies that both A1 and A2 actually have consequences. And such statements of consequentialism are entirely familiar, but are they well formed? Okay, consider a moral choice that you face. You could help an old lady across the street, or you could go to the park. Let's suppose that in fact you help the old lady. Did you do the right thing? 
Okay, I'm happy to allow it as a fact of the matter of the total value of the consequences of your action. But what about the thing that you did not do? You did not go to the pub. How good are its consequences? Taken literally, this does not make sense. There are no consequences of an action that is not performed. And immediately we encounter a problem with the very statement of objective consequentialism and its generalization, comparing one act with another. They do not make sense as stated so far. At a given choice, you actually perform only one action. So only it has consequences. So it seems that the statement should instead involve counterfactual actions and the consequences that they would have if they were performed. I think that's the most charitable understanding. Okay, let's say it more carefully. A morally right action is one that would have the best consequences if it were performed. For example, on the handout, Tansko's statement of utilitarianism, an action is right if and only if in the situation there was no alternative to it which would have resulted in a greater sum total of welfare in the world. This means that if there was something the agent could have done instead of the action he or she actually performed, which would have resulted in a greater sum total of welfare in the world, then he or she acted wrongly. Okay. Now, given the choice between two actions, one is morally better than the other, if and only if the consequences of the former action, if it were performed, would be better than those of the latter if it were performed. In fact, keep on going subjunctive. And again, this glides off the tongue all too easily. Again, I think there's an underappreciated but fatal problem, and I'll develop the problem in two ways, depending on whether the world is indeterministic or deterministic after the time at which the choice of the action takes place. If you're following along, we're up to indeterminism. Okay, let's assume the world is indeterministic. Rather plausible, that seems. It seems that the world has myriad chance processes, such as, well, coin tosses, let's assume they're chancy, lotteries, or if you prefer, quantum mechanical events. Now, focus on an action that you did not perform. So in the case that's running through the talk, going to the pub, you did not go to the pub. It's merely hypothetical. If you had gone to the pub, how would the first non-actual chance process thereafter have turned out? And to fix our ideas, let's make it the first non-actual coin toss thereafter. If you'd gone to the pub, the coin would have landed heads, not tails. That was a joke. I want you to be struck by the implausibility of this claim, and maybe even laugh at it. No, if you had gone to the pub, the coin would have landed tails, not heads. It's another joke, equally implausible, equally laughable, or so I say. After all, if the coin had been tossed, it might not have landed heads, and it might not have landed tails. That's what chance is all about. And I maintain that the truth of each of these might not counterfactuals entails the falsehood of the corresponding would counterfactual. Just try saying out loud, if you'd gone to the pub, the coin might not have landed heads, but it would have landed heads. Okay? Now, we could have a big discussion about the might not, you know, conflict with would. Uh, I don't even need that detour. I, I think just directly the chance is the problem, problem for the woods. But anyway, when I say might, I want you to hear it Ontically, not epistemically, epistemically. I'm talking about a potentiality in the world, not merely some agent's uncertainty. Okay, I disagree with the usual Lewis style similarity semantics for counterfactuals, but I think it's a useful heuristic to help convey my point. Okay, on this approach, the counterfactual, if it were the P, it would be the Q, is true just in case all the most similar P worlds. Q, and I say among the most similar worlds in which you go to the pub, some are heads worlds, some are tails worlds, they're not unanimous either way, so it's false that the coin would land heads, and false that it would land tails. Or consider the first 
non-actual lottery to be played after your non-actual trip to the pub. And suppose it has some large number of tickets, numbered one, two, three, etc. If you had gone to the pub, ticket number 17 would have won. That's another of my jokes. I didn't say they were good jokes. And it remains a joke, whichever number is pointed to and claimed to be the hypothetical winner rather than any other. Okay, for any ticket, I say it's false that that ticket would have won if you'd gone to the pub. It might not have. And by the way, it's important not to confuse this with the trivial truth. If you'd gone to the pub, there would have been a winning ticket. The implausible counterfactual is the one with the wide scope existential quantifier. There's a particular ticket such that it would have been the winner if you'd gone to the pub. Or if you prefer the similarity of worlds talk, the most similar worlds in which you go to the pub do not all agree on which ticket wins. Now, I say the counterfactuals are false, but an important alternative view says that they're indeterminate. I told you we were going to get that in. So Stallmacher thinks that there's a, always a unique, most similar, closest antecedent world. But in cases like these, it's indeterminate what it is. And he supervaluates over all of the arbitrary selections of the unique world. For each ticket, a world where that ticket wins gets selected by some admissible valuation. But since the valuations disagree, there's no fact of the matter of what the winning ticket would be. Now, I have reasons for favoring my view, but still, Stallacker and I agree that the counterfactuals are not true. And indeed, Stallacker can laugh with me at them. For him, it's, it's rather like laughing at uh, Juliet had blue eyes, not brown eyes, okay? which is indeterminate on, well, what's probably the right view of truth in fiction, but certainly a popular one. Now, indeterminacy is problematic enough for objective consequentialists to the extent they're committed to there being facts of the matter for such counterfactuals. Well, perhaps they could think that there's rampant indeterminacy about whether we did the right thing in almost all cases. But that's a considerable bullet to bite. But I have barely begun. There's recently been a cottage industry of observing just how significant an effect on subsequent history our actions have, even mundane or trivial actions. They have ripple effects. And they're not merely like the ripples on a pond caused by a stone throw, which dampen down and quickly disappear. Now, on the contrary, the ripple effects of our actions are ongoing and amplify. Our actions affect the identities of future people for the rest of history. These identities depend on the fine details of which sperm happens to fertilize, which egg on particular occasions. Changing the details changes the nature of the conceptions and hence the identities of the children that are subsequently born. Parfit makes much of this. Hilary Graves makes much of it. And it's plausible that these are yet more chance events. They're more lotteries in a broad sense. So if you'd gone to the pub, consider the first non-actual child to be conceived thereafter. I say that it's false of any particular sperm that it would have been the first to win its race to an egg. It's lottery. False that this child would have been conceived rather than some other. But I've still barely begun. Now consider that hypothetical child's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and so on for the rest of history. Consider all the non-actual people who would interact with all these hypothetical descendants and all their hypothetical descendants. I find it highly implausible that there's a truth of how all of these chance events would have turned out if you'd gone to the pub. And I've still barely begun. To deliver a verdict of what's right, objective consequentialism understood counterfactually is committed to there being a truth of the entire life histories of all these non-existent people, a truth of the exact timings and magnitudes of all their joys and sorrows, a truth of the entire counterfactual history. I mean, I feel like saying, really? For it's the total value of the consequences across this history 
that determines whether you did the right thing in helping the old lady, according to objective consequentialism. We are up to determinism. Okay, so far I've been assuming indeterminism after your pub joined. Now let's assume determinism, which you might think is the best case for objective consequentialism. Okay, now given the precise specification of the initial conditions and the laws of nature, we get an entire history determined thereafter from a snapshot of the world at a time of your choice, going to the pub, the rest of what happens in the world lawfully follows. Now it might seem more plausible that there's a truth of what would have happened for the rest of history if you'd gone to the pub. But now a different problem kicks in, the unspecificity of the antecedent. If you'd gone to the pub, somehow or other, well, how exactly? Now I find it implausible that there's a particular way that this loosely specified hypothetical scenario would be realised. If you'd gone to the pub, you would have entered it at 6.03 p.m. 24 seconds and 17 milliseconds. That was a joke. No, no, you would have entered it at 6.03, 24 seconds and 18 milliseconds. Another joke. Oh. <laughs> Again, I'm drawing attention to the implausibility of these counterfactuals. I find them implausibly specific, hitching together an inexact antecedent with an all too exact consequent. If you'd gone to the pub, you might not have entered it at 6.03, 24 seconds and 17 milliseconds. So it's false that you would have done so. And so it goes for any putative exact entry time, or said in Lewisian terms, the most similar pub worlds do not all agree on your exact arrival time. But yet again, I have barely begun. You're going to get sick of me saying that. Look, there's no truth of who the first non-actual child to have been conceived would have been, no truth of which sperm would have fertilized which egg if you'd gone to the pub somehow or other. And so on for the subsequent non-actual lineage of this non-actual child and all the non-actual people with whom they would interact and all the non-actual people with whom they would interact, blah, 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 and so on. Now, an objective consequentialist might reply they need not commit to a specific counterfactual history if you'd pubbed. A range of counterfactual histories is fine as long as the total value of their consequences is sufficiently delimited. For example, suppose all of them would have consequences whose total value falls below the actual total value of your helping the old lady. The consequences are right. Well, then you did the right thing. However, the chips might have fallen, helping the old lady was better. But this is a forlorn hope. Our everyday actions may have radically divergent effects on the total values of subsequent histories. This is bread and butter for the cottage industry. In one hypothetical history after your hypothetical tubbing, the, ch the children that happen to be conceived are a series of latter-day Buddhas, Einsteins, and a wonderful world ensues but with just a tiny tweak to the details of your pubbing, we get another hypothetical scenario in which the children that happen to be conceived are latter-day Hitlers and Stalins, and a nightmarish world ensues, and with other tiny tweaks, we get a whole spectrum of total values in between. And some of these scenarios are comparable in total value to that actually realized by your helping the old lady, some are much worse, some are much better. So there are not even moderate bounds on the total value that would have resulted if you got to the pub. And there's no truth of whether helping the old lady was better or worse. Yet as before, the exact details make all the difference, as it might be if you'd entered the pub at the 17 millisecond time, a series of moral saints 
and geniuses would have been created. Ah, but if you'd entered the pub at the 18 millisecond time, a series of moral monsters and charlatans would have been created. There's acute sensitivity to the exact initial conditions for the value of what would follow thereafter. So even under determinism, with an unspecific starting point, there's no fact of that value, nor even moderate bounds on it. Instead, there's a vast portfolio of live possibilities regarding what it might be. Okay, as I've been understanding objective consequentialism, it's committed to the truth of a staggering set of counterfactuals concerning the consequences of non-actual actions. I say such counterfactuals are false, follows, follows of Stolak, I say they're indeterminate. Either way, they're not true. Such counterfactuals had better not be the foundation of morality. We are up to clumsiness, cluelessness and clumsiness. At this point, one might reply, look, there is a truth of how exactly you would have entered the pub, the exact initial conditions associated with your pubbing, from which the rest of the counterfactual history deterministically follows. Let's suppose this for the sake of the argument. I won't be so concessive soon. There's still a dire problem for objective consequentialism, one worse than I think has previously been recognized. Now, the literature on objective consequentialism makes much of the so-called problem of cluelessness. We can never have the faintest idea which action would have the best consequences. I'm thinking of Lenman, Cowan, Birch Brown, Graves, Mogens, and a whole lot of people. That's the focus, cluelessness. All right, let's suppose that your 17 millisecond arrival time would initiate a history rich with latter-day Buddhas and Einsteins. Your 18 millisecond arrival time would initiate one burdened with latter-day Hitlers and Stalins. And the problem is supposed to be we could never know these facts or have justified belief in them. This is an epistemic problem. But this understates just how bad the situation is for objective consequentialism. Suppose that we could imagine somehow solving the problem of cluelessness. Suppose God tells you these facts. Then what? The trouble is that it's simply not under your control to realize these conditions in one precise way rather than another. Much as you might want to arrive at the 17 millisecond time, say, you cannot so finely tune your actions so as to do so rather than arriving at the 18 millisecond time. You're clumsy. When it comes to these extremely fine-grained actions, you're a klutz. By the standards of acute sensitivity to these exact initial conditions of subsequent history, you're ham-fisted, unable to steer things exactly this way rather than a closely neighboring that way. These exact arrival times are not genuine options for you. You cannot decide to realize one rather than another. And the actions that consequentialism evaluates should not be mere behaviors. They should be options that you can decide among. What God tells you is not action guiding in the sense that we should care about. As usual, I have barely begun. Okay, what would happen immediately after your arrival. Suppose that if you were to move your hands in exactly such and such a way for the next second, a Panglossian world would follow. But if you were to move them in an adjacent so-and-so way, a Panglossian world would follow. But you do not have such fine motor control over your hands so as to direct them the first way rather than the neighboring second way. And so it goes for the rest of your bodily movements and the exact time at which you order the beer and so on. Okay, let's put this in the form of a dilemma, depending on what we take the objects of moral evaluation to be for the objective consequentialist. 
first four of the dilemma. Let them be rather coarse-grained options, like you go to the pub, somehow or other. Then it's plausible that these really are options of yours, but it's not plausible that there's an entire counterfactual history thereafter, given the unspecificity of such options. That history and nothing else. Second horn of the dilemma. Let the objects of moral evaluation be precisely specified options, air quotes, like you go to the pub at 6.03, 24 seconds, 17 milliseconds, not 18, move your hands in such and such a way, not so and so way, blah, blah, blah. Well, perhaps it's more plausible that there's a truth of the entire counterfactual history thereafter, but it's not plausible that these are options for you. They're not things you can decide on. They're not genuine options that you can deliberately realize or not by an act of your volition. Hence, the air quotes, options. Your clumsiness renders you unable to realize one of these options rather than its near neighbors by an act of your will. Either way, objective consequentialism found us. Okay, we are up to, it's not just about you. But yet again, I've still hardly begun. I've engaged in a pretense in order to convey a point, but reality is much worse. So far I've pretended that under determinism, an exact specification of your pubbing would determine a unique counterfactual history thereafter. And Graves explicitly endorses this thought and generalizes it. You can see it on the handout. Assume determinism, she says, then for any given sufficiently precisely described act A, there is a fact of the matter about which possible world would be realized, what the future course of history would be if I performed A. Well, this is far from clear to me. For you are just a tiny part of the world. In the sweep of world history, you are just a speck. I'm sorry if this comes as news to you. Even describing precisely the details of your going to the pub, the millisecond of your arrival, your exact hand movements for the next second and so on, falls stupendously short of determining the entire world's initial conditions at that time. And under determinism, it's the initial conditions of the entire world and the laws that it entail the rest of history. The initial conditions of a minuscule part of the world, such as the arrival of one person in a pub, doesn't even come close to being a sufficient input for such an entailment. After all, what's going on elsewhere would also play a huge role in determining the identities of the hypothetical people that are supposed to be imagined. And these hypothetical people would interact in all sorts of ways, creating more hypothetical people who would interact in all sorts of other ways, blah, blah, blah. And never mind the people, don't forget about the dogs and frogs and trees and bees and electrons and photons and protons, not to mention pandemics, natural disasters, right? Now, this is an even more dramatic version of the problem of unspecificity of the counterfactuals antecedent. To get an entire history to follow from the specification of initial conditions under determinism, you would need to specify an entire time slice of history, not merely some tiny part of a portion of a fragment of a time slice of history, the details of your pub going. Even the exact specification of your pub going is just a minuscule sliver of the slice that's needed. Now, previously I found it highly implausible that there's a fact of the matter of exactly how you would have entered the pub. If you'd gone to the pub, you would have entered it at 6.03, 24 seconds, and 17 milliseconds, and other jokes. 
Now I think that objective consequentialism is committed to an even greater implausibility. If you'd gone to the pub, the entire world history would have been blank. Fill in the blank. There's an exact answer to that. Your action would make a tiny contribution to world history, given everything else that would be going on. So all the more, I find it highly implausible that merely fixing your action, highly unspecifically unspec unspec at that, is supposed to nail down the rest of history. And again, this is not a problem of cluelessness. It's not a problem that it's hard to know this history. It's not merely an epistemic problem. Rather, it's a metaphysical problem. There's no particular history that would ensue. Although, of course, that implies that there's nothing to know. The world itself is clueless. So I submit that the metaphysical foundations of objective consequentialism are highly dubious. Now, the statement might glide easily off the tongue, but when we scrutinize it, I think it falls apart. OK, but suppose that my critique is mistaken, Somehow or other, the foundations are in good order, despite everything that I've said. Then I still submit that objective consequentialism has jaw-dropping metaphysical commitments that have not been previously appreciated. We should have done a double, triple, quadruple take at the very statement of it, rather than nodding along with its easy, breezy statement. And only then should we have begun to discuss familiar objections. We're up to counterfactism. At numerous points, I've been sharing with you my incredulous stares at the counterfactuals to which objective consequentialism is committed. But perhaps I dismissed them too quickly. After all, there's a view about counterfactuals that needs to be taken seriously regarding such counterfactuals, and the view thinks that they're in good order. According to the view, it's on the handout, for any antecedent A, there is an entire world, W, such that if A were the case, W would be the case, is true. This generalizes Graves' claim, which I just quoted before, in two ways. It does not assume determinism. And it quantifies over all antecedents, not just those associated with an agent's actions. Let's call this counterfactual plenitude. And it's been defended by a most impressive lineup of philosophers. They go back to the medieval Molinists, who were primarily concerned with agents' actions, Molina, Suarez. But in modern times, they include the likes of good old John Hawthorne, Sarah Moss. Now, they find their inspiration from Stolmacher, Schultz, Bradley, Stephanson. Moreover, most of them are committed to what I call primitive counterfactuals realism. There exist primitive modal facts that serve as truth makers for all counterfactual claims. Call the conjunction of these theses counterfactism. That's called proponents of the conjunction counterfactists. Now, I've argued elsewhere that counterfactual plenitude commits one to primitive counterfacts realism. So really, my target is counterfactism. And as I say, I take it seriously. But what are my jokes? If you'd gone to the pub, the coin would have landed heads, not tails. If you'd gone to the pub, you would have entered it at 6.03, 24 seconds, and 17 milliseconds, not 18. OK, remember those bad jokes? And I invited you to laugh along with me. Well, counterfactists can laugh too, but not for my reasons. For them, the force of the jokes, to the extent that they have any force, is cluelessness. It's laughable to make such claims when one so obviously is not in a position to know them. So the laughter should be directed at a pragmatic defect, unassertability, rather than a semantic one, as I claim, falsehood. Indeed, the counterfactuals themselves may well be true, and in any case, counterfactuals just like them are true. It's just a matter of getting the details right in the consequence. One just has to state the counterfact that obtains.
Now, of course, doing so is beyond our ken, we're clueless, but that's an epistemic problem, not a metaphysical problem, or so say counterfactists. It's rather like epistemicism about vagueness, according to which there's a fact of the matter of how many grains of sand constitute a heap, although we can never know what that number is, and indeed it would be laughable to assert a particular number. Well, elsewhere I devote an entire paper. First I present arguments for counterfactism and then I argue against it, and I can't reprise all of that material here. One important argument for it is based on a suggestive analogy between future contingents and counterfactuals. Uh, counterfactuals are kind of like predictions from a hypothetical starting point. We might think of there being various possible futures which we might model as a tree and, as they say, a thin red line that traces true future branches. So counterfacts are like the analogues of the thin red line for alternative possibilities. All right? And, let, in fact, let me add more on behalf of counterfactism. Would is the past tense of will, so it's natural to think of counterfactuals, which we express, express with woods, as making predictions relative to non-actual starting points. Okay, having granted that the analogy between counterfactuals and predictions is suggestive, I now want to undercut it. For starters, predictions have their moment of reckoning. Regarding an actual coin toss, we simply wait and see what happens. If in fact the coin lands heads, then the prediction this coin will land heads is true or if you prefer, it becomes true when the moment of reckoning arrives. There's no mystery about its truth maker. It's a perfectly mundane, human, supervenient fact. But a counterfactual about a coin toss that never takes place has no such moment of reckoning. The truth maker, if, if the coin had been tossed, it would have landed heads, is altogether more mysterious. And according to counterfactism, it's a primitive, modal fact. It's not mundane at all. It's not human supervenient, not determined by the non-modal facts. Now, I don't even know how to begin to describe what such a putative fact would look like. Indeed, counterfactism is committed to a spectacular proliferation of such primitive modal facts. For each antecedent, A, there's a corresponding thin red line an entire future history that would have been realised if A had been the case. That's a lot of thin red lines, infinitely many. Moreover, presumably the counterfacts themselves could have been otherwise. For each true counterfactual about how they could have been, there's a, few, there's a further counterfact. And presumably each such further counterfact could have been otherwise, and so on, an infinite regress of primitive modal facts. The ontological commitment of counterfactism goes way beyond that of future contingents having truth values. And I just want you to keep this in mind if you think that this is what objective consequentialism should sign up for. This is not innocent. We are up to generalising the problem. The heart of the problem is objective consequentialism's appeal to facts regarding the long-term consequences of actions that are not performed. And according to this theory there, all that matters, the moral status of an action is entirely determined by such consequences. But a version of the problem will arise for any theory for which such consequences count for something. Even most deontological theories give some moral weight to the consequences of actions. For example, a deontologist may acknowledge while one has a pro tanto duty to keep a promise, this may be overwritten, overwritten if the consequences of doing so are sufficiently dire. Rawls writes, it's on the handout, deontological theories are defined as non-teleological ones 
not as views that characterize the rightness of institutions and acts independently from their consequences, all ethical doctrines work our attention, take consequences into account in judging rightness. One which did not, will simply be irrational, crazy. Okay. Now, maybe a rapid, rapid deontologist would agree with Kant that one's duties can never be overridden. For example, one must tell the truth about where one's friend is, even when a murderer asks for it. But surely a more sensible deontologist will allow that at least some consideration must be given to consequences. And to the extent that these are long-term consequences, the problems I've raised for objective consequentialism will kick in. It makes no sense to speak of the consequences of an action that is never performed. That's just nonsense. And it's a jaw-dropping metaphysical commitment to appeal to counterfactuals about what the long-term consequences would be if the action were performed. To the extent that deontological theories make such an appeal, their foundations are also suspect. Likewise, virtue ethics must traffic in the consequences of actions to some extent. Hearst House. Uh, actually, let's just go straight to Hearst House and Pettigrew. It should go without saying that the virtuous are mindful of the consequences of possible actions. How could they fail to be reckless, thoughtless, and short-sighted if they were not? But again, an action that is merely possible does not have consequences at all. Let's stop. And long-term counterfactual consequences are as suspect here as they were before. The problems of cluelessness and clumsiness will also recur for any plausible moral theory to the extent that they acknowledge the significance of long-term consequences and attempt to characterize it with counterfactuals. And again, there's acute sensitivity of the consequences to the exact way an action is realized. To the extent that the consequences matter, this acute sensitivity will matter. Yet you're clueless about them. And you're clumsy, the point that I've been adding. You have limited control over your actions. You cannot, as an act of the will, realize them one particular way rather than some close neighboring way. And as before, a dilemma arises for these alternative theories. If the objects of moral evaluation are coarse-grained options, then it's implausible that there are facts that matter about how they would counterfactually be realized. If they're fine-grained options, to the exact millisecond and so on, then it's implausible that you can decide to realize one rather than another. And as such, it's implausible that they really are options for you at all. And consider, again, the best case for there being a fact of the matter of what would happen were you to act in some non-actual way, determinism. And again, we may specify as precisely as we like the details of your hypothetical action. We're going to the past. But what would then happen depends on much more than you. For the rest of history to follow, a snapshot of the entire world at that time is needed. But all we have is a selfie. Now, to be sure, the deontology and virtue ethics are not as beholden as objective consequentialism is to exactly what the consequences will be. But given how perilously the consequences may vary, depending on the fine details of what you do and what the rest of the world does, the dogs and the frogs, the photons and the protons, and even various versions of these meta-ethical theories risk boundary. Where do we go from here? So far, my discussion has been almost entirely critical. How did we get into this predicament? 
Okay, let's return to objective consequentialism as I've been understanding it. Three moving parts led to the problems that I've raised for it. First, it, it appeals to long-term consequences of actions. Second, it understands consequences with counterfactuals. Third, it's objective. Accordingly, I want to briefly consider three ways we might improve it. First, appeal to short-term consequences of actions. Second, understand consequences with objective probabilities. Third, understand consequences with subjective or evidential probabilities. Let's talk about short-term consequences. Remember, I found it highly implausible that there's a fact of the matter of the entire counterfactual history of consequences until the end of time that would have transpired if you'd performed some action. But it's more plausible, much more plausible, that there's a fact of the matter of the short-term consequences, local consequences of your action. If you were to help the old lady across the street, she would be significantly happier for the next couple of minutes. If you were to go to the pub, you and perhaps some others would have fun for the next hour or two, and so on. Such claims are straightforward common sense. The serious metaphysical problem that I raised for long-term objective consequential seems to be evaluated. The serious metaphysical problem that I raised for long-term objective consequentialism seems to be alleviated. There's no longer a striking mismatch between the strength of the antecedent and that of the consequence. We, we've now greatly weakened the consequence. While we're at it, apparently the problems of cluelessness and clumsiness are alleviated too. Common sense has it that we often know such simple counterfactuals. And it seems that the fine details of how you act don't matter much for the short-term local consequences. You could help the old lady across the street in a myriad of ways, and still bring about her being significantly happier for the next couple of minutes. You could arrive at the pub at a wide range of exact times and still have fun for the next hour or two. Clumsy you might be, but it shouldn't matter. The, the proximate consequences should turn out much the same. As long as the counterfactuals are suitably circumscribed, and that's what the short-termist wants, all is well. Or so it seems. Well, for what it's worth, I think that even such short-term counterfactuals are false, but that's because of my particular, some might say peculiar, view about counterfactuals. And I have not presupposed that in the bulk of the talk. I think that most counterfactuals are false because of either the chanciness of their consequence or unspecificity of their antecedents. By the way, there's this annoying fact that the words consequence, T-S, and consequence, C-E, are homonyms, which is an annoying coincidence, which is almost a homonym also. Anyway. If you were to help the old lady, she might not be significantly happy, happier for the next couple of minutes. There would be some chance of your offending her or her falling badly or having a heart attack or what have you. If you were to go to the pub, somehow or other, you might not have fun for the next hour or two. You might get into a fight with someone. A friend might break some bad news to you or what have you. So I still think that the requisite counterfactuals for objective consequentialism are problematic, even on its short-term formulation. But now I acknowledge, now I'm the crazy one. Now I'm the one with the surprising metaphysical commitments. My view flies in the face of common sense. But previously I thought it was clearer that the long-termist objective consequentialism had the crazy consequences crazy commitments. Be that as it may, short-termism has its own problems. It violates any notion of impartiality. Someone's distance from your choice in time and space should not get you off the moral hook 
for the effects that you have on them. Sidgwick has emphasized this, Singer even more so. Perhaps long-termism goes too far in the other direction from short-termism, and the truth lies somewhere in between, though it seems arbitrary to consider only limited time spans. One might apply some sort of discount weight to the weight to be given to consequences, depending on how temporally or spatially distant they are. But Parfit argues forcefully against any such temporal discount rate. I can't resolve this whole big debate here. But anyway, these problems carry over to the ontology and virtue ethics to the extent that they put at least some weight on consequences beyond the short term. And notice, the longer the termism goes, the further out we push the horizon of the consequences that matter to moral evaluation, the more my concerns about the requisite counterfactuals have bite. Now, I found it implausible, the striking mismatch in specificity between a weak antecedent, you go to the pub, somehow or other, and a strong consequence. The entire world history would be thus and so, nothing else. The more detail it gets added to the consequent, the stronger it gets, and yet the antecedents kept fixed. So the worse the mismatch between them gets as we push out that time horizon. It becomes progressively less plausible that there are facts of the matter of what the consequences would be for extended periods after a hypothetical action, the more extended those periods are. As we look, belong, as, as we look beyond the short term, we improve the ethics, but we compromise the metaphysics. Let's talk a bit more about understanding consequences with objective probabilities. I think the probabilities are in better order than counterfactuals. I prefer to formulate consequentialism in terms of probabilities, and various authors do, for example, Frank Jackson. In particular, the notion of expected value is probabilistic. It's a weighted average of possible values, the weights being the conditional probabilities. That's on the handout. The value of a given consequence is multiplied by its conditional probability of being realized given an action. The expected value is the sum of such products. In your choice between helping the old lady and going to the pub, the right thing to do is the action whose consequences have higher expected value. And we get rid of the problematic counterfactuals altogether. Well, this pushes back the problem of understanding consequences counterfactually to the problem of understanding probabilities. Ah, but we have a vast literature on the interpretation of probability to draw on. This is something I've thought a lot about. In particular, we may distinguish objective probabilities, let's call them chances, subjective probabilities, call them credences, evidential probabilities, also known as degrees of confirmation. Okay, I suggest that objective consequentialism should be formulated in terms of objective probabilities. The morally right action is the one that maximizes expected value of its consequences where the weights are chances, conditional chances at the time of the choice. And more generally, given a choice between two actions, one's morally better than the other, just in case the expected value of the former's consequences is greater than the latter. Well, to be sure, this will give rise to a new problem of cluelessness we will typically have no idea what the requisite chances are. At least we're not saddled with a jaw-dropping metaphysical commitment. We're plausibly committed to chances anyway. Our best science seems to tell us as much. Statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics are explicitly probabilistic theories, and it's natural to understand their probabilities objectively. But it would be nice to make some progress on the problem of cluelessness too. Let's turn to the third option, understanding consequences with subjective evidential probabilities. Okay, so now the obvious move is to replace the 
objective probabilities with subjective probabilities, those of the agent in question. Uh, that brings us to Frank Jackson's decision theoretic consequentialism. The morally right action for this agent is the one that maximizes subjective expected value of its consequences, where the weights are her conditional credences. Assuming the agent has introspective access to her own credences and values, the problem of cluelessness vanishes. Actually, I'm not sure I do want to assume that the credences are luminous to herself, but let's not worry about that right now. Now the problem is with this subjective probabilities. On one version, they're unconstrained. They're just whatever the agent, agent's credences happen to be. Anything goes as long as they obey probability theory. Now that's far too unconstrained to serve as a basis for a moral theory worthy of the name. After all, not anything goes when it comes to morality. Uh, Hillary Graves advocates a version of the principle of indifference. And you might regard that as a central constraint on evidential probabilities, probabilities that measure evidential support relations. And she th thinks that in various cases in which the cluelessness objection has been leveled, there really is no problem. Okay, consider the proposition, helping the old lady would lead to happy unforeseeable effects while going to the pub would lead to unhappy ones. Consider the proposition that reverses those effects. She says, well, we have no more evidence in favor of one proposition rather than the other. So by the principle of indifference, we should assign them the same probabilities and so on. And she argues that such unforeseeable consequences then make no contribution to the difference in expected values. Okay. So, the foreseeable effects carry the day. Uh, I, I, well, we're at the time we've got about three minutes left. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So now she's well aware of the classic problem for the principle of indifference that it apparently gives different answers depending on how we carve up the possibilities, you know, the Tron style paradoxes. She's not troubled by this. She thinks that. The principle just needs to be suitably restricted. And some authors restrict the principle to maximally specific propositions. Keynes did that, Elgar. Well, of course, that won't apply to the cases before us, which involve much more complex propositions. Also, Hillary Graves appeals to no more evidence in favour of. Now, that sounds to me like a probabilistic relation, a constraint on conditional probabilities. One might worry that an appeal to it is circular when one's trying to constrain probabilities. Anyway, the principle does seem to work sometimes, you know, Monty Hall problem or what have you. I want to just raise quickly problems that will trouble me rather more about the principle of indifference. I'll call them cases of mild sweetening. And I take my lead from the literature on incommensurability of options, cases in which the preference relations among options are incomplete. Okay, take two options that are incommensurable. They remain so after mild sweetenings of one of them. We don't suddenly form a preference for the sweetened option. Uh, Raz's example, choosing between two successful careers, lawyer, clarinetist, Neither career seems better than the other. They also don't seem exactly equally good. And the test of that is, imagine just slightly sweetening, say, the law career. You don't suddenly think, ah, now it's easy. I've got to switch preference. Now, I, I think there are going to be versions of this sweetening against the principle of indifference. Uh, one that I'll just quickly mention, I don't have time to really go through it. Let's call it evidential sweetening. You just slightly evidentially sweeten one of the two propositions to which the principle of indifference is supposed to apply. If it applied, you started exactly equal with your credences, and then with the slight evidential sweetening, one side gets a boost, and it should be just clear, okay, that one's more probable. I think that's, that's not what's going on in these hard cases of cluelessness, where you're in this sort of epistemic fog. Uh, 
uh, I'll just say a little bit more about what I call propositional sweet sweetening. Now we're going to enlarge slightly one of the propositions in question. So we'll replace it with a strictly weaker proposition, but barely so. Okay, you have no more evidence in favour of helping the old lady leading to a horrible future than puppy doing so. You have no more evidence in favour of the former leading to a future in which a new Hitler kills at least a million people that rather than public doing so. Epistemically, it's a wash. Okay, now replace the former proposition by a strictly weaker proposition. So now let's make it the new Hitler kills at least a million minus one people if you help the old lady. Let's keep the other proposition the same. So I've slightly enlarged, I've fattened the first proposition. Well, you don't suddenly think, oh, now it's easy. Now, clearly, the higher probability for that rather than the other. No, it's, it's still epistemic fog. Okay. And I think that's symptomatic of a deep problem in the principle of indifference. So I'm less sanguine than Graves is. And then the very last thing, this is just one more minute. So just one other principle to consider is the principle principle. And look, I'm sympathetic to evidential probabilities, much as they're difficult to ascertain. That's another problem with cluelessness, by the way. But given previously I was speaking in favour of objective chances, let's now appeal to the principal principle, which is meant to constrain rational credence. And there it is, the credence of A, given that the chance of A is X, is X. Rational agents follow that. Well, you're supposed to track the chances to the extent that you know them. What if you don't know them? You're unsure about the chances. Well, then you're supposed to put credences over various hypotheses about what the chances are and take an expectation of them. But we're still not out of the subject in woods. What constrains these credences, the weights, on the hypotheses. And now the worry is that the principal principle bottoms out in unfettered subjective probabilities. And again, that's a dubious foundation for morality. It better not be the case that anything goes for these weights. We need some rational constraints on them. And our moral problem now awaits our solution to this epistemic problem. And so it goes. Okay, this brings me back full circle to how I began the talk, I said that foundational issues in probability and counterfactuals bear crucially on moral philosophy. We've seen the very formulation of consequentialism and perhaps of moral theories more generally bring in their train a host of such issues that I've barely begun. Thanks. Concerned about the differences and like what would happen if we did three. Well, you always four minutes. You always go off for like you know six, seven, eight minutes at a time. I know. <laughs>